Hey everyone, and welcome to a new video, or a not-so-new video if you're watching this in the future. Today's topic is cellular automata, or how simple rules can produce complex and unpredictable behavior. Like most computer science concepts, cellular automata was discovered by John von Neumann while he was fantasizing about self-reproducing robots and his colleague Stanislaw Ulam studying something kind of completely unrelated in the 1950s. Ulam and von Neumann worked together to create a method of fluid simulation, modeling an area as a collection of cells that contain fluid, with the motion of the fluid dependent on its neighbors' behavior. Thus was born the first cellular automata, and absolutely no one cared. It wasn't until the year 1970 when John Conway invented the very famous Game of Life that cellular automata as a concept broke into the mainstream and wasn't exclusive to academia. So how do they work? Let's start with the simple, one-dimensional automaton. An automaton consists of a grid of cells. Each cell exists in any number of states, but it's usually two, on or off. Each individual cell is only concerned with itself and its neighbors, and each advancement of the automaton is referred to as a generation. A new generation is created according to rules defined by the creator of the automaton, and is usually the same for every cell. To demonstrate, let's go through one generation of the one-dimensional automaton known as Rule 110. The rules for this are as follows. If the cell and both its neighbors are on, the cell turns off. If the cell and both its neighbors are off, it stays off. If the cell and its right side neighbor are off, but its left side neighbor is on, the cell stays off. Otherwise, the cell turns on. Let's look at one state of a 6-cell rule 110 automaton and draw its next generation. This grid has two active cells, the third and the fifth from the left. To find the next generation, let's start with the first cell. This cell is off, its left neighbor is the cell on the other end which is also off, and its right neighbor is off. This means that by rule 2, this cell will remain off. Moving on to the next cell, it and its left neighbor are off, but its right neighbor is on, therefore it turns on. The next cell is on, its left and right neighbors are off, so it turns on. The next cell is the opposite, but it still turns on. The next cell is the same as the third, so it turns on. The last cell is off, its left neighbor is on, but its right neighbor is off, so it stays off per rule number three. We have now created the next generation of this automaton. The original generation could be referred to as Generation T, and this new one can be referred to as T plus 1. Now you might be thinking, this seems kind of stupid, but let's look at it on a much larger scale. Isn't that neat? From such simple rules emerge complex, seemingly random structures. But it isn't completely random, it's consistent enough that a man named Matthew Cook proved in 1994 that this automaton is Turing complete, meaning it can be used to simulate any computation or computer program. Not all cellular automata are created equal though, as most rule sets result in completely repetitive behavior or absolute chaos with few standing above the rest like Rule 110 or Conway's Game of Life. Speaking of Conway's Game of Life, let's move into two dimensions. Things change a little bit when we add the new axis, and it introduces a new question. What is considered a neighbor of the cell? There are two types of cell neighborhoods, the Mohr neighborhood and the von Neumann neighborhood. The Mohr neighborhood includes diagonals, whereas the von Neumann neighborhood does not. Other than that, the concept is the same. A cell has a state, and it changes based on the behavior of its neighbors according to a set of rules. You've seen Conway's Game of Life before assuredly, so I won't show you that. Instead, I'll show you a less popular variant of it called Brian's Brain, invented by Brian Silverman. 
The rules for it are as follows. A cell may be in three states, on, dying, or off. Each cell has eight neighbors. A cell turns on if it was off but had exactly two neighbors that were on. All cells that are on go into the dying state. All cells in the dying state turn off. Anyways, without further ado, let's run the simulation. You know, I just think that people, when they say that they, you know, hate cellular automata, they just, they don't have context. They don't know where it comes from. Cellular automata was born in a little room at Los Alamos National Laboratory just because von Neumann couldn't stop thinking about self-replicating robots. No one could understand him or talk to him. The only way they could communicate was with algorithms. I think part of the problem is that you can't hear it. You have to see it. You have to see what's at stake. I mean, look at these fellas. Look at this spaceship right here. He just hijacked the grid. He's on his own trip. Every one of these guys is turning off, on, or dying. And now look, this other spaceship, he's got his own idea. And so it's conflict and it's compromise and it's just, it's new every time. It's brand new every cycle, and it's very, very exciting. Unlike my last video, Cellular Automata has applications in many fields, most notably chemistry, physics, and computer science. Due to their application in physics, many video games use Cellular Automata to simulate physics like water, a specific example being Terraria, Another popular example is Noida, which the entire pixel simulation is, at its core, a cellular automaton with each pixel being a cell. In cryptography, cellular automata can be used as a one-way function, since it's nearly impossible to inverse some rule sets. One example is this pattern in Conway's Game of Life. This square is stable, meaning it will stay that way for every generation in the future, as long as it is left alone but this pattern can also be formed by this pattern and its next generation. So how can you tell, given a generation, if this pattern was formed in the last generation or has remained stable for thousands of generations? You unfortunately can't. In chemistry, cellular automata has been used to model the belusov zabutinsky reaction, which, if you haven't seen, it looks like this. And Niall Red has a cool video on it, which you should definitely watch. I have actually gone through the trouble of implementing this cellular automaton, and it looks really really cool, so as a reward for those still watching, you get to see it. The rules for this automaton are as follows. A cell exists in n states. This represents how infected a cell is. An example would be 100, where 0 is healthy, and 100 is completely infected. If a cell is completely infected, it magically becomes healthy again. If a cell is between 0 and n, then it becomes the average of the values of its neighbors plus a constant g, where g is the rate at which the infection spreads. If a cell is healthy, it becomes a weighted average of the number of infected and ill neighbors. And that's it. I do have to give an epilepsy warning though, as it flashes a lot, so please skip ahead to the time shown if that's a concern.
us on the moon. What a night for love with such ecstasy. All right, isn't that the coolest shit you've ever seen? There are so many more patterns that this automaton produces that I'd love to show you, but I unfortunately can't put them all in one video. So if you'd like to play with it yourself, the Unity Project code is in the description. Anyways, that's all for this video. This was originally going to be another paltry programming installment, but the topic was a little too big for that, so it is its own thing now. Unfortunately, my main project has been delayed two weeks due to hardware issues, so I put this out in the meantime. Make sure to subscribe below so you know when that video comes out, and check out my other socials for updates. But I gotta go now, so have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you next time. Alright, alright, alright. Here's one more for the fans.